Afternoon Theatre. There are two kinds of pity. One is nothing more than the impatience of a heart that doesn't want to get involved. A kind that is not really pity at all, but a means of self-defense. A refusal to accept someone else's misfortune. And the other kind, the only one that counts, is the pity that has decided to endure everything patiently to the limit of its strength. Beware of Pity. A novel by Stefan Zweig, adapted for radio by Gert Westphal and translated by Harry Guest. Music by Peter Zvetkov. The scene is a small town in Austria-Hungary just before the outbreak of the First World War. There is a dinner party going on at Kekersvalva's castle. It is the first time Lieutenant Hofmiller of the Lancers has been invited. Tall and slim in his best uniform, he is standing in the doorway of the great dining room. The butler announces him. Lieutenant Hofmiller. The other guests are already at table. Forty pairs of eyes look up. Strangers' eyes which weigh up the late comer. Forgive my being late, sir. I hope my batman was in time to present my apologies. Yes, indeed, Lieutenant. It was particularly civil of you to send your batman. I know what the army is like. It was the least I could do. But as I wasn't sure when you would come, we uh, started dinner. His host speaks and looks more like a schoolmaster than a nobleman, and his eyes look slightly tired behind his gold spectacles. But now, please come and sit down. I will introduce you to the company later on. I shall be delighted. May I perhaps just introduce you to my daughter? Edith, my dear, may I present Lieutenant Hoff Hope Miller? On it. Good evening, Lieutenant. Two grey eyes glance at him briefly. The Lieutenant bows to her and then to the company generally, who are obviously pleased not to have to go through the whole ceremony of formal introductions. Very tactfully, he is placed next to the one person he knows, the Baroness Elona. Good evening, Baroness. Do you remember me? Of course. You were playing chess in the cafe in the village when I went in the other day. How could I forget? That's how it had all begun a few days before. And that was how he had first heard the name Kekersvalda. The name that was to open the gates of this magic castle to him. Burgundy, sir. You haven't tried the foie gras yet. Oh, you are spoiling me. I've never dined so well before. <laughs> when she laughs, the air sparkles. Her arms are bare and his hand occasionally touches hers, not always by accident. This is a wonderful evening, Baroness. <laughs> Will you have a maraschino, Lieutenant Hofmiller? Champagne, please. After a glass of champagne, I feel that I can... <laughs> <laughs> I drink your health, Lieutenant. <laughs> May I have the honor of this dance, Baroness? Her eyes say yes, even before he makes his bow. Her arms soft and cool. He leads her into the drawing room. While the old people watch and chaperones chatter... Several couples spin over the floor, which mirrors their dance. You dance wonderfully, Baroness. The whole evening is wonderful. He is happier than he has been for years. He dances brilliantly with each of the four most beautiful women there. Then he returns to Ilona, the Baron's niece. He laughs and dances in circles. Suddenly, he hears a small silver chime as half past eleven strikes. Something occurs to him. I have forgotten to dance with the Baron's daughter. She's not dancing. She is not in the drawing room. She can't have left. She's the daughter of the house. He finds her at last. She is in the next room, sitting between two old ladies. It is just because the flowers near her are so warm and crimson that the lieutenant is aware how pale her brow is under the auburn hair. But there is no time to stand looking at her. He must make up for his rudeness at once. May I have this dance? May I have this dance, Baroness? She doesn't move for two or three seconds. Then suddenly her pale cheeks flush. She closes her mouth tightly. Only her eyes continue to stare at the lieutenant. Baroness, 
With a convulsive movement, she clutches the table and the vase of flowers totters. At the same time, something heavy falls with a clatter from her armchair to the floor. Oh, oh, there, there. Oh, my dear. Oh, my poor child. Cripple. I can't dance like the others. The two old ladies take hold of her gently. She lets go of the table and falls back in the armchair. She is still crying. I, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I, I'm sorry. Neither of the old ladies bothers to glance up at him, and the lieutenant wheels out of the room. Suddenly, he sees Elona's face before him. Have you gone out of your mind? Didn't you know? No, I didn't. I, I didn't. This is the first time I've ever been here. Edith is a cripple. She can't take two, two steps without her crutches. And you go and ask her to dance. But, Ilona, I didn't do it on purpose. Oh, please tell her how sorry I am. You must. I couldn't know. I only saw her for a second at the dinner table. Please explain. Ilona! But Ilona has gone hurriedly through the dancing couples. They'll all know in five minutes. Soon everybody will be talking about what I did. The servants will gossip about me, and by tomorrow the whole regiment will know. He decides to run away now before the couples have left the floor. Before he sees his host, he stumbles towards the door and runs through the hall. Are you leaving us already, sir? The lieutenant flings his coat over his shoulders and runs out. In front of the castle, he stands for a moment in the cold wind, his heart full of shame. I don't know how I managed to get back home. I can only remember the first thing I did when I got there. I drank three glasses of Slivovitz to try to get rid of the sick taste in my mouth. Then I threw myself down on the bed and tried to think back over what had happened. It was only a misunderstanding. Anyone might have done the same thing. But it wasn't only that I'd ruined the wonderful evening I'd been having with Ilona. I felt cruel. If only I'd kept my head, I could have made it all right again. But I ran away and spoiled everything once and for all. That's why I feel so guilty. That's why I'll be blamed all my life, why all my friends will gossip about me. At last, I fell asleep. But I could have only slept lightly and feverishly, for images of the evening kept swimming before my eyes. I saw Edith's anguished face, her hands grasping the table. I heard again the sound of something falling, which must, of course, have been her crutches. And I kept on imagining the door opening and her father coming in. Once the apparition was so vivid that I leapt up, I saw the reflection of my own face in the mirror, pale and beaded with sweat. But in the light of day, you can think more clearly than you can in the dark. You are not haunted by ghosts once the sun is shining. And perhaps no one else noticed. Only... Poor Edith, and of course she will never... No. He suddenly thinks of something. Quickly, he changes his uniform, brushes his hair, and hurries past his astonished Batman. But, sir, I've got your coffee. He goes down the stairs, three at a time, passes the sleepy soldiers on their way to see to the horses, goes out through the gate, and runs to the flower market in the square. Just look at those roses. And fresh in this morning, smell them. Have you ever seen better? Oh, they are beautiful. How many would you like? All of them. Oh, sir. If you just make up a bouquet, or, yes. or, or, or better still, could you arrange them in a basket, do you think? Oh, but of course, Oh, sir. then I'll be off. If you all arrange them as beautifully as you can and send them straight away, I'd be very grateful. Good morning, then. But a Lieutenant Hoffmiller, uh, sir, not so quickly, sir. Where am I to send the flowers? You haven't given me the address. Oh, Sorry. Uh, they are to go to the Baroness Edith von Kekkesvalve. Ah, oh, yes, of course, Baroness Edith. The Kekkesvalves are my best customers. Do you want to send a little message? Uh, yes. Uh, please forgive me. No, that, that won't do. No point in reminding her of the incident. Um, j just, just put my card in yes. with them, will you? Just my card. The flowers took all that remained of his month's salary. He would have to avoid Grossmeyer's cafe for a while, but at the moment he doesn't mind. In fact, he's pleased that his stupid behavior should be costing him so much. So he goes back to the barracks and pours out his coffee. I had to warm it up again for you, sir. He goes through the morning's duties punctiliously, but without much enthusiasm. At lunchtime, on the way to the mess, his batman runs after him. Lieutenant Huffmiller, sir. Oh, this has just come for you, sir. He hands him a long rectangular envelope of blue paper with just a hint of perfume. On the back 
is a coat of arms. The writing is precise and sloping. A woman's hand. Dear Lieutenant Hofmüller, thank you for the lovely roses. I didn't deserve them. They are far too beautiful. I keep on looking at them. Please come to tea any afternoon you like. You don't need to tell me in advance when you are coming because, unfortunately, I am always at home. Edith von Kekersfalfer. Her handwriting looks gentle. He remembers the way her narrow hands clutch the table. He remembers her pale face. Dear Lieutenant Hoffman, thank you for the lovely roses. Please come to tea any afternoon you like. How discreetly she ignores his appalling indiscretion. How tactfully she herself refers to her infirmity. Unfortunately, I am always at home. Unfortunately, I am always at home. She is a real aristocrat. I must go and thank her for the invitation. Today is Thursday. Then I'll pay a visit to her on Sunday. Sunday? Uh, no, I'll go on Saturday. On Friday, he is in the drawing room up at the castle. Ilona greets him and takes him to Edith. The crippled girl is sitting in the same armchair by the green jade table. There is a white fur rug over her lap, which hides her legs. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Hofmuller. Edith smiles at him. She has probably been rehearsing this scene. I hope I'm not disturbing you, Baroness. This is their second meeting, perhaps a fatal one. Please sit down, won't you? can't help noticing the embarrassed way she stretches out her hand to him over the table. She hasn't forgotten. What can we offer you, Lieutenant? Tea or coffee? Well, whichever you are having. No, it is for you to choose. Well, um, I'd prefer coffee, if I may. And Ilona leaves the room to tell Josef. The Lieutenant is embarrassed. He doesn't dare look at Edith. Won't you sit down, Lieutenant? Oh, thank you. I want to thank you for those wonderful flowers. See how beautiful they look in that vase. And, and I want to apologize for the way I broke down yesterday. I was so ashamed I couldn't sleep a wink. Oh, you meant it so kindly. How could you possibly have known? Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, you guessed what I was thinking. You see, I was deliberately sitting where I could see the dancers. And the moment you came in, there was nothing I wanted to do so much as to dance. Oh, I love it. You see, when I was, when I was young, I danced very well. I still dream I'm dancing every night. In fact, perhaps it was a good thing for Papa that this happened to me. Otherwise, I might have run away and become a dancer. It must be wonderful to have to dance for a living. Think of it, to have to dance. I collect all the pictures I can of the great ballerinas. Saharet, Pavlova, Kasavna. I got pictures of them all. I'll show you. They're in that box over there by the fireplace. The Chinese lacquer box. Oh, uh, here? No, no, to the left, by the bookshelves. Oh. Yes, that's it. Bring it over here. See, the very first one is Pavlova. She's my favorite. The door opens and Edith hastily closes the box. Don't tell the others. Don't breathe a word of what I've told you. The white-haired servant in exquisite livery wheels in a richly loaded trolley. The coffee, madam. Ilona comes in behind. She serves Edith and her guest, sits down herself, and at once the tension is perceptibly eased. They talk for an hour, perhaps an hour and a half, and then someone comes in cautiously, almost as if he were afraid of disturbing them. Uh, please, uh, don't get up, Lieutenant Hofmiller. It is her. He bends over his daughter and gives her a kiss. The observant eyes behind his gold spectacles make him look rather like a doctor. The worried way he glances at her disturbs the easy rhythm of the conversation they were having before he came in. Excuse me, sir. He's very punctual, Josef. Tell him to wait. No, he can go away altogether and leave me in peace. I don't need him. Oh, please stay, Lieutenant. It's perfectly all right. But, Edith, dear... I, I really ought to be going. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. Josef ought to have waited instead of blundering in like that. It's only the masseur, a daily torture I've got to undergo. I have to do awful exercises, and it's supposed to do me good. It's my doctor's latest idea, and it's as useless as all the others he's had. But, dear, you don't really think that Dr. Condor... Oh, all would... right, I'll see him. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. Please excuse me. But I do hope you'll come again. She picks up the small bronze bell on the table in front of her. There are bells like this near her everywhere in the house. Yosef reappears. 
Help me, Josef. Just to get up, I'll walk by myself. Josef bends over her and with an obviously practiced movement takes hold of her fragile body under the arms. Once she stands upright... No, stay here with Father, Lieutenant. She looks at them all, then picks up the two crutches that were hidden underneath the blanket, bites her lip, and with extreme difficulty she crosses the room. Yosef walks immediately behind her, his arms ready to catch her in case she falls. The lieutenant realizes she won't let herself be helped. She wants everyone to know she's a cripple. The distance from the table to the door seems endless. The lieutenant stands there hardly daring to breathe, listening to the dry tap tapping of the crutches. Finally, the noise dies away behind the closed door. But still, the lieutenant makes no move. Don't be offended, Lieutenant. If she seems a little brusque sometimes, these last few years, the poor child has gone through a, a great deal of pain. We've tried all sorts of treatment, but improvement is very slow. No wonder she gets impatient. But what else can we do? Kekas Falva stays by the tea table. He doesn't look at the lieutenant. He has picked up a spoon and traces strange patterns on the table, still not looking at the lieutenant. If only you could have seen her before this happened. She was so full of life, so daring, so... And this had to happen to her. Yet, you know, it's very easy to make her happy. I wish you could have seen how delighted she was when your flowers arrived. You'd have almost wept. You can't imagine what a sensitive person she is. She'll be regretting the way she lost control just now. But how long can a child like that go on being patient when progress seems so maddeningly slow? While talking, his eyes have never left the strange patterns the spoon was drawing on the table. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I've got no right to inflict our problems on you. It's just that I didn't want you to feel any resentment about the way she behaved just now. The lieutenant suddenly takes the old man's hand in both of his. Kekas Viber looks at him in some surprise. They both feel unwilling to break the silence. The lieutenant bows and goes out quickly. Allow me to help you, sir. In the hall, Josef helped him on with his coat. Suddenly, Lieutenant Hofmiller knew without looking round that Kekas Valva was standing in the doorway, that he wanted to thank him. He felt embarrassed and pretended not to notice that he was there. Uh, good night, Josef. Good night, sir. And he hurried away from the house of tragedy. warm, though the air is cold against your face. The smell of the dew, the smell of the fields. Your breath steams in the morning air. This is the best time of the day to ride. But today, it's as if some other hand were controlling my reins. I can see the square walls of Kekisfalfa Castle, and perhaps someone in the castle can see me. Someone I hurt because I wanted to dance, and someone I might be hurting today because I can ride. No. Stay here with Father, Lieutenant. I don't seem to have the courage to enjoy my health anymore. Second formation! Start! That tug on the reins was the beginning. It was, as it were, the first symptom. He had been infected with pity. Three days later, a letter from Kekasvalva lay on his table. Dear Lieutenant Hofmiller... Would you care to come to dinner next Sunday? This time the guests will be all male. I have invited Lieutenant Colonel von Frieser from the Ministry of War, whom I have doubtless already mentioned to you. If you accept, it will please my daughter and Elona as much as me. Coffee is served in the drawing room. There is a wide choice of liqueurs and, of course, thick cigars with coloured bands round them. You won't mind if I smoke my own cigarettes, will you, Kekas Falva? The Baron leans forward to speak to Lieutenant Hofmiller. Would you care to join us in a game of cards, Lieutenant? Or would you prefer to talk to the ladies? <laughs> the latter, sir, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if I win, the Colonel will resent it. If I lose, that's the rest of my month's pay gone. After sending the basket of flowers, he has only got 20 crowns left in his pocket. How's life down at the garrison, Lieutenant? I was at school with your colonel, you know. Joseph has set the card table up, gentlemen. 
The lieutenant sits down by the two girls, who both appear particularly charming to him tonight. Edith doesn't look as pale as she did last time. Perhaps she has put on a little rouge in honor of the guests. She seems calmer, less agitated. Have another cognac, Lieutenant. Oh, no, no, really, nothing more. I, I shall get drunk. <laughs> Elona's eyes are sparkling. The lieutenant feels he could very easily fall in love with her. Does he avoid the temptation because he knows she is already engaged? Or is it because of Edith? Tell us another story, Lieutenant. The cognac warms him. He is enjoying a cigar after another sumptuous dinner. His conversation is neither clever nor deep. He is just telling commonplace little stories, just gossiping about garrison life. So the, the private said, uh, Sir, aren't you sitting the wrong way round on that horse? I said the officer, you don't know which way I want to go. <laughs> the girls are delighted with his stories. Edith is in high spirits and her clear laugh rings out. There seems to be health and even beauty in her face tonight. Her grey eyes are sparkling with happiness. And the lieutenant takes pleasure in looking at her as long as he can forget her crippled legs. The three of them go on laughing and chatting till midnight. But finally, goodbyes have to be said. Of course I'll come again. Promise you will. The day after tomorrow, or even tomorrow. I shall look forward to it. And he goes into the hall with the other guests. The car is ready, gentlemen. The lieutenant gets his own coat because Joseph is busy getting the lieutenant colonel's. Thank you, Joseph. But the lieutenant suddenly feels someone helping him into his coat. It is Kekka's father. Oh, uh, no, no, sir, please. It's, it's all right. I, I can manage. You don't know how happy it makes me to hear her laugh. It was just like the old days before she... Shall we be off then, lieutenant? Kekka's father does not want to go on talking when the lieutenant colonel is there. But his hand touches lieutenant Hofmiller's arm. And in the shy little gesture, there is a whole wealth of gratitude and tenderness. So as the lieutenant follows his superior officer to the car, he has to be careful no one notices how moved he is. In the next few weeks, he spent almost every evening up at the castle. It was a pleasant habit to get into. He was spoiled, perhaps dangerously so. It was an exciting experience for a 25-year-old man who had passed all his life since boyhood in one garrison after another. I had found a real home at last, a place where I was treated just like one of the family. This is the book I was telling you about. But... Go on. Take it with you when you go. Now sit down in your chair. My chair? It was always placed near Edith. I'll see you later, then. Yes, all right, Alona. At the beginning, it had been Alona who had captivated me. But now I was far more delighted to see a smile on Edith's face, to receive a flash of gratitude from those grey eyes. You will come again tomorrow? I hope you're not angry because of all those silly things I've been saying. You know how glad I am when you come here. These are strange and tender emotions, but dangerous emotions as well. Because a relationship between a healthy person and a sick one, between a free man and a prisoner, cannot be a balanced relationship. Somebody who has been unfortunate is easily hurt. And continual pain makes a person unjust. Wait a moment. I, I, I'll put your cup nearer to you. Must you go on reminding me I'm a cripple? But Edith, dear. And gradually, to his own surprise, he became aware of the effect these words of his had on her. He had only to say... But Edith, dear. And the ill-tempered line between her brows would disappear. She would look down. She would blush. It's raining. You can't go back yet. I've just sent for the chauffeur. He'll take the lieutenant home. Oh, no, really, I... It's the least we can do. It's a very comfortable car. Would you stop in the square, please? It would never do if a mere lieutenant should be driven up to the barracks by a chauffeur in full livery and actually helped out of the car like an archduke. Uh, perhaps my friends are still in the cafe. He hasn't been at their regular table for a week. is already in darkness, but in the billiard room at the back, lights are still burning under green shades, and there his friends still are, Lieutenant Ferenc, Lieutenant Yotzi, and the regimental doctor. Hello, Tony. Ah, you honor our sordid table with your presence. A uh, coffee for me, please, Grossmeyer. Now, oh, it's new. Well, the best bit of news is that you've deigned to put in an appearance at last. Tony's got his best uniform on him. Yeah. And he's wearing patent leather shoes in this weather. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's supposed to be pretty good up at the Baron's place. Five-course meal every night, so our friend the chemist says. Caviar, champagne. 
It's a bit different from the stuff we've had to put up with. You know, Tony, we'd underestimate it. I must say you might spare a thought for us. You, you might just drop a word in the old man's ear, you know. I've got a couple of friends I'd like to introduce you to. I hope at least you've brought back some cigars. No, I haven't. Still, have a cigarette. He takes out his cigarette case without thinking. It had been his 25th birthday the day before, and the two girls had found out. So when he had picked up his napkin at dinner, he had felt something heavy inside. It was a gold cigarette case. Well, well, look at that, Yossi. Real gold. Oh, and look at this. There's an inscription. To our dear friend Anton Hoffmiller, with many happy returns of the day from Elona and Edith. You have only got a box of matches from me. Would you care for another game of cards? Oh, do you hear that? He wants another game at half past twelve <laughs> when the place is closing up. <sighs> the rich don't worry about time. Of course, his friends hadn't meant it unkindly, but something had been destroyed in him. His confidence. Up till now, I thought I was going to the castle to give and to help. Yachts and the others take it for granted I'm a parasite. I oughtn't to have accepted that gold cigarette case. Nor the silk scarf. An officer oughtn't to allow expensive cigars to be slipped into his pocket at the end of an evening. What about the horse? God, I must speak to the Baron tomorrow. I'd forgotten he'd said something about lending me a horse. That chestnut mare of yours now, Lieutenant. Which, of course, I'm still paying for. It's not a very good horse, is it? He's right, of course. But I can't let him lend me a three-year-old out of his own stable. Now, this is a beautiful horse. You could win any race you liked with this one. He said lend. But I know what that means. He wants to buy me the way he's bought Ilona. He's promised her a diary if she'd nurse his daughter for him. He's paying cash down for my pity. And I hadn't noticed how I was turning into a complete parasite. He has forgotten how the old man touched his sleeve in the hall that night. How he smiles each time he comes into the room. A complete parasite. He has forgotten the obvious sincerity of the two girls. Well, I shan't go up there tomorrow. Why didn't you come yesterday? There must have been a good reason for keeping us waiting all day. Otherwise, you'd have rung us up. Oh, of course I would have done. Only we had a, an inspecting officer, Diane, and then I'd hoped to get away at five, but the colonel wanted me to put a new horse through spaces for him. Oh? Did the colonel like this horse? Uh, well... I don't know whether he... That's enough of these lies. There was no inspection yesterday. At half past four, you were in the cafe. And they certainly didn't bring the colonel's new horse in there for you to look at. At six, you were still there, playing cards. Our chauffeur saw you. I had sent him to find out where you were. I thought you must be ill. You would have telephoned. Now you're saying to yourself that I'm on edge. Well, I can't bear to be kept waiting. That's why I sent the chauffeur. I'm not ashamed to tell you all this, yet you think up all sorts of stupid lies. Edith, my dear, it was just... Look, let me explain. No, I don't want to hear any more of your lies. Why didn't you just say, I don't want to come yesterday? I don't want any sacrifices. I don't want you to feel you have to come up here and give me two hours of your pity every day. If you want to come, then come. And if you don't, then stay away. But don't make up ridiculous stories about inspections and new horses. Now, let's close the subject. Give me a cigarette. The lieutenant's hands are usually firm and steady, but now he gropes uncertainly for a cigarette and his hands tremble as he tries to light a match. What's the matter? Why are you trembling like that? How could my silly outburst have moved you? Papa is right. You are... A remarkable man. The door opens softly and Kekasfalva comes in. He might have heard the last few remarks, or perhaps it is just the usual shy and guilty way he approaches his daughter. I, uh, I should like a word with you, Lieutenant, uh, if you please. You don't mind, my dear, if I take your guest away from you for a moment? I have no claim on the Lieutenant. I'll say good night, then. We'll go to my study. Uh, that is, uh, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. I should be honoured. Sit down, Lieutenant. Uh, sit down, please. I have a great favor to ask of you. I know I've got absolutely no right to trouble you. You hardly know my family. You can refuse, of course. He has taken his glasses off. Without them, he seems naked and defenseless. But I... I've trusted you right from the start. 
You were a good person. You were considerate. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you are. When you're as old as I am, you have only to glance at somebody and you know him through and through. But I didn't ask you whether you'd be willing to listen to my request. Would you? But of course. Thank you. Do you know how this happened to Edith five years ago? No. My wife had been dead for some time. Perhaps it was fortunate. She would never have been able to bear it. Of course, I, I didn't know that it would last this long. Think how much we all respect doctors these days. Almost every day you read in the paper some new miracle they can do. So, of course, you don't doubt that they can do the simplest thing possible. Cure a child who's born healthy and who has always been healthy. I never believed that God would permanently harm an innocent creature. You've tried every kind of medical advice, I suppose. Of course. We, we would travel miles to see any famous doctor. They've tried this and that. They, they, they've said there's hope. They've taken their money and gone away again. And everything stayed exactly the same. Well, uh, uh, there has been an improvement, I, I must admit. But, but no one has been able to cure her completely. Only one has really persevered with her. Uh, Dr. Condor. Perhaps you've heard of him. You were in Vienna for some time, weren't you? Yes, but I haven't heard of him. I can't tell you whether he's a better doctor than all the others. But I do know that he is a better human being. He's got a burning desire to be stronger than disease. And not because of ambition like the others. Uh, not to get rich or get a title. The old man has become very excited. His eyes, still unprotected by his glasses, have taken on a gleam of violent enthusiasm. He's a marvellous man, I tell you. He once undertook a case where he wasn't successful. He'd promised that he would save the sight of a woman who was going blind. And when she did eventually go blind, he married her. Think of that. A young man marrying a blind woman seven years older than himself. Oh, she wasn't beautiful. She was penniless, neurotic. She'd been nothing but a burden to him. You could see what sort of a man he is and how fortunate I am to have found somebody like him. He will help her if anybody can. And pray God he can. The old man joins his hands together as though in prayer. Now, Lieutenant, this is the favor I want to ask you. It's just because Dr. Condor is such a good man that I feel anxious... I'm always afraid that he considers my feelings and therefore won't tell me the whole truth. I am old now and none too well myself. I must know if I shall live to see my daughter walk again, completely cured. I must know that. I can't go on with this uncertainty. He stands up and crosses to the window. The lieutenant knows this movement now. When Kekka's father feels tears coming into his eyes, he turns away quickly. He doesn't want pity any more than his daughter does. Forgive me, I... I didn't intend to say as much as that. Yes. Dr. Condor arrives tomorrow from Vienna. He will examine Edith about midday and leave by the night express. I thought it would be a good idea if you were to ask him, quite casually, as a stranger, someone quite disinterested, whether she will ever be completely cured and how long he thinks this will take i don't think he would lie to you he, he doesn't need to spare your feelings but naturally you, you you mustn't let him know that i've spoken to you will you will you do this for me yes sir i promise you i'll do that for you ah, i knew you would the first time you came back here and was so nice to edith after well, well, you know, I, I felt straight away that there was someone who'd understand. And if, if ever I can do something for you... No, 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 don't misunderstand me. I don't mean anything material. I just mean that I have good contacts. I, I know a number of people in the various ministries, in the Ministry of War, for example. And it's always useful nowadays if you have someone you can count on. And you never can tell. There, there might be a time when, you know... Kekos Valva has not once glanced at the lieutenant while he has been talking. Now he looks up, slightly exhausted, and puts his glasses on again with trembling fingers. Oh, perhaps we'd better go back. Otherwise, Edith might guess we'd be 
Since she's been ill, she's become far more acute than normal people. From her room, she knows everything that goes on in the entire house. She guesses what you are thinking before you've spoken it. Therefore, I... I must suggest we go back before she starts suspecting something. It is difficult to describe how moved I was by this conversation. That the Baron should have chosen me out of all his friends and acquaintances pleased me more than any congratulations or praise I'd ever received. But my pleasure was mixed with guilt when I realized how thoughtless I had been. How could I have gone on coming to this house week after week without asking the obvious question? Will she always be crippled like this? I didn't once think of asking her father or Ilona, and now I too was worried by the same question that had been tormenting the Baron for years. Can this Dr. Condor really release Edith from her suffering? Will she ever run upstairs again, chasing her own laughter, happy and carefree, how fine it would be to gallop over the fields with her. One evening I'd be able to bow and say, may I have this dance? And she'd nod, looking at me with those grey, inquiring eyes. I should be delighted, Lieutenant. And we'd spin over the floor that would mirror our dance. patiently counted the hours till I could speak to Dr. Condor and learn the truth. Dr. Condor was a disappointment. A thick-set little man, short-sighted and bald-headed, wearing a crumpled grey suit dusty with cigarette ash. His eyes looked rather dull behind cheap-looking steel pince-nez. At the end of the evening, the lieutenant found no difficulty in leaving the castle with him. Uh, no, please don't order the car, Baron. I'd, I'd really prefer to walk. I need some fresh air. I spent the entire morning in the hospital and then caught the train to come here. But of course, I will take the lieutenant with me. Uh, no, no, really, I ought to be off. I'm on duty very early tomorrow. Well, if it's all the same to you, we'll walk. You know, our host ought to get more sleep than he does. A full moon stood in the sky, a polished coin of silver in the starless night. Their feet crunched on the frozen gravel. Condor didn't break the silence until they had shut the garden gate behind them. Poor Kekus Falfa. Perhaps I was a little short with him, but he'd have kept me there for hours if he could, asking me a hundred different things, or rather the same thing a hundred different times. And I simply couldn't stand any more. You expect questions and complaints the whole time from your patients, and you've got a stock of comforting phrases for them, just as you've got sleeping tablets or painkiller. But no one makes life so impossible as relations who always want to know the truth. I have explained over and over again that I've got a very serious case at the moment in Vienna, a matter literally of life and death, yet he telephones every day and insists on speaking to me personally, trying to wrench some hope out of me by force. Forgive me, Doctor, but I would like to ask you something, if I may. You know the case better than anybody. Is Edith's paralysis incurable or not? Condor looked up sharply. The lieutenant had to lower his eyes. Had the doctor suspected Kekas Valva's request? It always comes to this in the end, doesn't it? Curable or incurable? For me, there is no such thing as an incurable disease. There are only diseases that aren't curable now. Three months before I took my degree, my father died. He'd been in constant pain for years. Diabetes. Now, just listen. A few days ago, I was at a conference, and we heard a lecture about some experiments that are being carried out in America and elsewhere, and apparently with very satisfactory results. So within a decade, it is hoped we will be able to cure diabetes. Or at least uh, to keep it in check. Now, do you think I'd go on plaguing Edith with new methods all the time if I didn't hope to cure her eventually? So you believe she'll get better? Which means you must have already noticed a certain improvement. Nonsense. Have you noticed any? You've known her for a few weeks. Remember, I've known her for five years. But the Baron described... Don't you know how cunning doctors are? When we haven't the faintest idea what to do, we keep the patient occupied. Unfortunately, nature becomes our accomplice and deceives the patient as well. But I've seen myself how well she can walk now thanks to your electric bars. No, they helped me, not Edith. I needed them at the time simply to keep the old man patient. I had to gain time. Her father thinks I can work miracles and you yourself question me now as if I knew all the answers. But, Doctor, You're I... shocked. 
Well, I'm sorry. Medicine's got nothing to do with morals. Every disease is itself a revolt against the natural order. Therefore, you are justified in using any means you choose to fight it, any means at all. <laughs> you must feel no pity for the patient, because the patient is an outrage against nature. And you've got to reinstate nature against the patient's own will. Perhaps I'll find the correct method by chance. Perhaps I'll merely gain time until the correct method is found. I need time and I need new ideas. That isn't easy, I assure you. I've been having to find new tunes to play for five years now. I'm afraid it's time for me to be off. On the dark horizon over the houses, a streak of lightning flashed. The heavens answer us, you see. We're in for a storm. Uh, come with me for a little way, will you? Yes, of course I will. I don't want you to think that I've given the case up. On the contrary, I'd willingly go through another five years. As a matter of fact, I've just read about a colleague of mine in Paris who succeeded in curing completely a 14-year-old boy who was paralyzed for two years. And it seems this Professor Vierno only took four months to do it. Of course, I've written to him and asked for details. Perhaps there is a possibility there. I say, perhaps. Anyway, I've probably said too much. Do you mean... I mean nothing. I know nothing, I promise nothing. Thank you for your company. You'd better go back quickly, otherwise you'll get so... And without shaking hands with the lieutenant, the doctor hurried away into the station, visibly annoyed. Condor's prophecy was correct. There was going to be a storm. The lieutenant hurried through the small park that lay between the station and the barracks. He had almost reached the gates, when in the bright second of a lightning flash appeared the figure of the old man, bareheaded, his gold spectacles gleaming. Baron, what in heaven's name are you doing here? Didn't you say you were going to bed? No, no, no I, I couldn't sleep. I wanted to... But you must go home quickly. The storm's going to break any moment. Isn't your chauffeur here? Uh, yes, over there. Well, hurry, if he drives quickly, you'll be home in time. Now, come on. Yes, yes, I'll come, but first tell me. What did he say? What, what, what did who, who say? Dr. Condor. You asked him? Oh, yes. tomorrow. I'll tell you tomorrow everything he said, every word. Now, please, come to your car. But the old man staggered like a drunken man and collapsed on the bench. The wind drove the leaves over the path and blew them up into their faces. The old man did not notice. For him, the clouds and the rain did not exist. Tell me, please, what did he say? The only thing on earth that mattered to him was whether his child would get better or not. How could I have made myself tell him the truth? That, in fact, Condor knew nothing yet. He sat by me, trembling, stuttering with excitement and weakness. He just wanted some hope to cling to. So I told him the few reassuring things I'd heard from Condor about the new cure which a Professor Vierno had tried in Paris with great success. And immediately I noticed how he pulled himself together. I oughtn't to have said anything more, but the pity I felt for him made me go on saying what I had no right to say. Does he really believe that? Did he really say that? And in his weakness and impatience, the lieutenant replied yes to every question. I felt his confidence grow with every word I spoke. And for the first and last time in my life, I felt something of the intoxicating pleasure of creating comfort. Do you really think so? Yes, I do. Really. Neither of them paid any attention to the blue flashes of lightning nor to the roar of the thunder. They sat there close together, talking, then listening, talking, listening, outbidding one another in their fantasies. Yes, she'll get better. She'll be completely cured, and soon completely cured. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Then the gust of wind that announced the real storm swept past them, and they were enveloped in a swirling cloud of dust. Now you must go home. They ran to the waiting car. The chauffeur helped the old man get in. But just as the lieutenant was arranging the rugs over the old man's knees, he grasped the lieutenant's hands before he could be stopped, and the old man kissed the right hand, then the left, over and over again. Until tomorrow, then. And the car roared away as if driven by the ice-cold fury of the wind. On the next day, he didn't realize what he had done. He didn't grasp how far his pity had led him on. And so he was surprised by the sense of joy, the dizzy happiness that was waiting for him up at the castle. At last. I've been waiting for you all day. 
Now, quickly, tell me everything, and in detail. Papa was so confused. Do you know, he came and woke me up in the middle of the night. You ought to have seen him. He was laughing. It was so good just to hear him laugh with happiness. Then Elona arrived. Yes, and we laughed and talked till it was dawn. Now, tell me, what is this new cure? He stood appalled. What had Condor said? What could he himself have said? What was it that pity had forced out of him to make this house bright with gaiety again, a distracted man feel young again, and a suffering girl think she was well? What's the matter? Why are you hesitating? What did Dr. Condor tell you? You, you, you know already. It, it's very good news. <sighs> but when will he begin? How long does the treatment last? There's no definite time limit. Dr. Condor only spoke in general terms about the method. He, he doesn't know yet. I, I mean, I mean, no two cases can ever be quite the same. You don't know him. He's terribly cautious. But if he only promises something in the most general terms, you can bank on it absolutely. Oh, you just can't imagine how I feel. Edith was transformed. But the lieutenant was confused and worried by what he had done. And yet at the same time pleased to have done it. As in a dream, he walked back to the barracks. Seeing his batman, he smiled at him and gave him a crown before he'd had time to open his mouth. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, there's a telegram come for you. He tore it open with unwilling fingers. There were very few words in it. Submit to K. Stop. Essential, I see you first. Stop. Expect you 510 station. Condor. I'm glad you're punctual. Well, I'll get straight to the matter. Dr. Condor pushed the lieutenant before him into the first-class waiting room. The room was empty now that Vienna Express had gone. Now, sit down. The day before yesterday, I got a telegram. A dear friend, please come most urgently. Expect you most impatiently. Sincerely grateful, Kekka's father. Then yesterday, a long, long letter from Edith arrived. She couldn't say how happy she was, how much she trusted me. She assured me she would obey me utterly in every way once the new cure had begun. Now, at those words, the new cure, it dawned on me what had happened. You must have talked. I now, only... please don't deny this. I had spoken to no one else about Professor Vero's methods. It must be on your conscience that they all believe up there that Edith will be cured in six months. However, I didn't ask you to come here to accuse you, but to... Well... What I've got to tell you will give you an unpleasant shock. I received Vierno's answer yesterday morning by the same post as Edith's enthusiastic letter. Unfortunately, his method is not applicable in Edith's case. So now you see where things stand. You have driven the girl mad with hope. The lieutenant felt his hands grow cold. He recognized that Condor was right, but he instinctively felt the need to defend himself. But I only did it with then the best out of intent. pity. Yes, I know. But pity is a two-edged sword. Anyone who doesn't know how to use it should leave it alone. Never let your heart be involved in an affair like this. Pity isn't a medicine. You can see yourself what you've done. I must go and tell them the truth. And truth is a bitter medicine. But wouldn't it be better... Well? I, I, I just mean better to wait a little. Wait? Well, at least for a few days. You can't imagine how the mere mention of the new cure has affected her. If you can only leave her in this frame of mind for a little, just let her believe this new cure is going to work, then, then she'd have such inner strength. I really thought yesterday she was moving better already. You know, Lieutenant, you're quite a psychologist. Yes, yes, you could do that easily. I could send her to the Engadine, where there's a doctor who's a friend of mine. We could let her think it was the new cure, whereas in actual fact it'd be the old one. And certainly, at first, she would make great progress. But as a doctor, I must think not only of the beginning, but of the continuation. And above all, of the end. But you yourself have just implied there would be a substantial improvement. At first, yes. But what then? What will happen when she finds she's been deliberately deceived? No, no, no. Never postpone telling the truth. Would you have the courage in my place? Yes. I wouldn't tell her the true facts of the situation until she had made that initial improvement. She'll have to know the truth sometime, and her disillusionment will be a hundred times more dangerous. In fact, the shock might be greater than she could bear. This could endanger her life, Lieutenant. 
Will you accept such a responsibility? Yes, I will. I'm absolutely convinced that it will help Edith immeasurably if she can be made to believe in an eventual cure, just for the time being. If it becomes necessary to explain that we, that I, perhaps promise too much, then I will take it upon myself to break the news to her, and I know she will understand. Well, if you take on the responsibility of making Edith accept reality again and of preventing her having a setback, I think we can risk postponing the truth. But I warn you, immense strength is needed to revive and console someone you have deceived. Can I rely on you to stand by me unconditionally? Unconditionally. Good. Then I shall advise her to try a cure in the Engadine, but I shall explain that Vierno's method is in no way proven and that neither she nor her father must expect a miracle to happen. If in spite of that they insist on putting all their faith on a cure, then it is up to you to clarify matters. Well, that settles it then. It's time I was going. Three hours later, the lieutenant found a note on his table. It had been left for him by the chauffeur. Dear Anton, come tomorrow as early as you can. I've got so much to tell you. Dr. Condor has just been here. I am to leave with him in ten days. I cannot tell you how happy I am. Edith. Everything went according to plan, as by now the lieutenant rather feared it would. An enthusiastic welcome greeted him the moment he entered the garden. Why are you bringing me all those flowers? I'm not a prima donna. Oh, aren't they lovely? <laughs> well, we're off to the Engadine in ten days' time. I'd always known that those electric baths and massages were no use. But now you'll see. Why don't you say anything? You just sit there looking stupid. <laughs> Sorry, looking shocked. Just like the day before yesterday. Elona, please put those flowers in water. Yes, my dear. Now, won't you be happy like me? Of course. I'm terribly happy for you. You don't show it much. Oh, but, dear child... Don't always call me that. You aren't all that much older than I am. But why shouldn't you be happy? You're getting a few months off now we're closing up here. So you're free of your boring good Samaritan duties for a while. Oh, you must be looking forward to it. Do you really think that? July, August, and September are the worst months for us in the cavalry. It's our busiest time. Nothing but maneuvers and parades. You're on duty from morning to night, right to the middle of September. But, uh, when will you come and see me, then? Where? Oh, don't be silly. Where do you think? In the Engadine. Where else? Oh, I'd like to see my colonel's face when I ask him politely for a few days off in the middle of the summer maneuvers, just to go to Switzerland. And you'd hear one or two words that aren't in the dictionary. But you can think of an excuse. Papa will arrange it for you. He knows plenty of people in the Ministry of War. Oh, then he must also persuade the Ministry to give me a travel grant. What do you mean? How much do you think a journey like that would cost? Not very much. A few hundred crowns at the most. <laughs> do you know what a lieutenant gets? Have you ever thought? Two hundred crowns a month. And he's got to live as best as he can with that. Do you buy me such expensive flowers? You mustn't spare another thought about what it costs. Of course you will be our guest. Let's not mention the subject again. I must just say something else. We don't want any misunderstandings between us. I know you and your father mean well, but I will not allow him to get me any leave from my regiment. Then you don't want to come? I didn't say that. I simply told you the reason why I can't come. Even if I asked you? Asked you most sincerely? Please don't ask me. It wouldn't be any use. Good. Now I know how sincere your friendship is. I'm glad. Just tell me, though, why do you come up here at all? Well, that's obvious. Obvious? Oh, better come up here than be at a loose end. Edith, dear, I can't say anything else but that I come up here because I like seeing you and because I feel so much happier here than anywhere else in the world. When you and I talk, I... Well? Well, perhaps you'll think I'm being a bit presumptuous, but... I have the impression that you like my being with you. When I see you, I feel... What do you feel? That there's someone to whom I'm not entirely unimportant. Of course, I know I'm a pretty ordinary sort of person, but then I remember how you sit alone up here, and perhaps you're glad if someone comes and sees you. Can you understand this? Yes, I understand. I understand very well. You come here out of pity. 
Thank you very much. I don't want a friend who's only interested in me as a cripple. Don't look so shocked. Of course you're hurt when someone tells you the truth. Thank you for sacrificing so much of your time to me. Well, I don't need you. I don't need anybody. I'm soon have finished with it all anyway. Look, do you see this scar? I tried it once, but the scissors were blunt. But I missed the artery. This knife is better. I'd rather die than have your pity. Edith! Go, get away! How dare you touch me? Let go! Let go, I say! Just when he didn't obey, she twisted her body and pushed him away from her. Get away from me! The effort made her lose her balance, and to try to stop herself, she grabbed the table. The lieutenant tried to catch hold of her. Edith! Edith! But they fell together, and the cups and plates fell and shattered all round them. The lieutenant bent over her, and her hands suddenly clasped his head and pulled his mouth down to hers. She kissed him greedily, desperately, and clutched him to her. Once she let go of him for a moment and looked into his eyes. Then once more she kissed him on the cheeks, the forehead, the eyes. You silly idiot. You fool. You fool. Suddenly she let go of him. Her head fell back onto the stone and her eyes glowed in triumph. Now go away. You idiot. You silly idiot. They heard steps. Was it Ilona, they wondered? Or had Yosef heard the noise of the crash? Terrified of meeting anyone, the lieutenant rushed through the garden. And for the second time, he was a fugitive, fleeing like a thief from this fateful house. For heaven's sake, what are those silly asses playing at? Back! Get back and reform! Colonel Kubitschek, the commandant of the regiment, is bellowing across the parade ground. Two columns have charged into each other, one of which is commanded by Lieutenant Hofmiller, who has given a wrong order. Now he has to answer for the confusion. And as he gallops up to the colonel, he can feel Edith's letter rustling inside his tunic. It had arrived shortly before they had set out for this morning's exercise. Lieutenant Hofmiller. Dearest one, I don't want to go on living unless I can love you. He salutes the colonel. Sir? Just give me some sign that you love me in return. Have you gone out of your mind, Lieutenant? This has all happened against my will. I've never seen such a gullible mess. I want to get well again for your sake. Never in my whole life. If you believe in me, I shall no longer be a cripple. Just pull yourself together, man. I think of you every moment of the day. Haven't you got any sense at all? Forgive me for loving you, my dearest. The lieutenant stands immobile at the salute. I will not permit an officer of mine to give such a bloody silly order. I don't want to see your damn face again today. Come and report to me tomorrow at noon. Then, with the sudden brutality of a kick. Yes, miss! I'll give everything up. Everything. I'll leave the army. I want to get away, even from them, in their decimal castle. The lieutenant still thinks he wants to get away. Even though, while he sits in the Vienna Express, he can't get Edith's passionate letter out of his mind. I implore you, my darling. Don't be angry with me. I want to get away. He thinks he does, even when giving the address to the cab driver. Dr. Emmerich Condor. Florian Gasse, 97 in the 8th. And the cab rolls through the streets of Vienna. Yes, this is where Dr. Condor lives, but he's not at home. He's gone out to Meidling. But he told Madame he'd be back for dinner. Please come in and wait. You can sit in here. The lieutenant looks round the room. The furniture is shabby. He thumbs through the tattered papers, stands up, Sits down. Ten past seven. A quarter past. A child cries in the courtyard. A battle organ starts up in the street. Seven twenty-five. Seven thirty-five. Where can he be? At last the door opens and Condor comes in. To what do I owe this visit, Lieutenant? Aren't things going according to plan? Read this letter. I have begun this letter six times and then torn it up. I didn't dare to betray my feelings. But now you know. I am in love with you. What a fool I was not to have foreseen this. It's a mistake I've made before. To think only of the disease and not of the patient. Now you know that the only reason I want to be cured is for your sake. Forgive this love, my dearest one. And I ask only one thing of you. 
Don't be afraid of me. Poor child. Don't think I want to be yours yet. Not while I'm ill and ugly. I'm going to wait patiently until God has mercy on me and cures me. You have shown pity for me the way no one else has in the world. Oh, God, what have we done? Now she won't be satisfied with a slight improvement. She must be completely cured. Just send me a note or, or just a sheet of paper with your name on it or a flower. Some sign that I don't disgust you, that you don't completely reject me. I don't want to go on living unless you let me love you. This is an extremely dangerous situation. I agree. You must write to her at once. You must say... What must I say? Well, that this infatuation is childish. It's insane. You must explain to her. Explain what? Explain she oughtn't to be in love? Should I say you're ill, you're crippled, you haven't the right to be in love? No, but I can't say that to her. No, of course you can't, neither can I. The poor child must never know that you find her love unbearable. You must never let her suspect it in your slightest gesture or word. But somebody must explain to her. Explain what? I mean, that it's hopeless, completely absurd, so that she, when I... The lieutenant, you didn't come here simply to show me this letter. Either say what you have to say clearly and comprehensibly, or I must ask you to leave. The little doctor's spectacles glinted accusingly. The lieutenant looked at the floor. I don't find your silence very comforting. Perhaps you intend to break off your so-called friendship as a result of this letter. Or perhaps some event that made her write it. Do you want to shake them off? Now, when you've turned her head with your pity? You know what that would be, don't you? The lieutenant was silent. It'd be cowardice. Cowardice, do you hear? Come now, don't draw yourself up and take offence like that. We'll leave your military code of, of honour out of this. More important things are at stake than my calling you a coward. We are talking about a young person for whom I am responsible, so I won't be polite. I repeat, it'd be cowardice or even murder. Edith is very sensitive and very proud. How do you imagine she would take it if the first time she offers herself to a man, he answers her by running away? It'd be murder. And what is worse, premeditated murder. But, Doctor, what, what ought I to do? What can I do? H how can I behave as though I was encouraging her? I mean, it, it's madness. I wouldn't be able to keep it up, and I, I won't try. I won't. I couldn't keep your voice down, for heaven's sake, and sit down again. Now, let's take things one at a time. Of course you're horrified when a passionate confession of love has been made to you, and you don't reciprocate her love. But I must ask you whether, in this case... Is it Edith's being a cripple that revolts you? No. Oh, no. Good. Then I could only assume... May I speak frankly? Of course. Well, that you are horrified, not because of the idea itself, but because of the consequences. How do you mean? I mean that you are afraid that others will get to know of your love and laugh at it. So you are afraid of being a laughingstock. The lieutenant said nothing. Condor had read his heart. This was, in fact, why he had kept his relationship with Edith secret, why he had never breathed a word of it to any of his brother officers, and why occasionally he had felt ashamed of it himself. No need to feel ashamed. I understand better than anybody what it's like to be afraid of people once you do something out of the ordinary. But believe me, it's rewarding to take on something very hard and difficult if you're saving another human being by doing so. I'm not strong enough. Don't count on me. You must help, Edith. I can't. It's better you know now, so you won't be disappointed later on. Don't... don't count on me. I want to know the whole truth. Have you taken some definite step? Have you done something irrevocable? Read this. What is it? My letter of resignation. I'm leaving the army. Condor read it slowly and then folded the sheet of paper up carefully without speaking. This letter would mean that you left the district. Yes. And didn't come back? Yes. So it isn't only a letter of resignation, but also a death sentence. A death sentence for Edith. You realise this, of course. I've asked you once, and I shall ask you again. Do you take the full responsibility on your conscience? The lieutenant said nothing. The doctor moved across to him and held out the sheet of paper. The lieutenant turned away and put his hands behind his back. May I tear it up? 
Yes? I think we have prevented a tragedy. And now to business. I must say I'm grateful for this opportunity to get to know you, but I'm unhappy about the way you make decisions so quickly and then as quickly give them up again. But don't do anything sudden from now till Edith goes to the Engadine. And above all, don't let her guess from anything you say or do how this love of hers disturbs you. I don't think this is a difficult request. Seven days of self-control to save a girl's life. Will you do it? Of course, of course I'll do it. And if something should crop up, I mean, if your strength fails or if Edith suspects and loses her confidence, you may send for me at any hour of the day or night. I'll know what it's about. And now I must go to my wife, otherwise she'll worry. Even after so many years, I must be careful never to offend her. Somebody who's been hurt by fate once can so easily be hurt again. The doctor stood up and put his hand on the young man's shoulder. I'm glad you came to me and didn't just run away from her. After all, you can run away from anything, but you can't run away from yourself. Goodbye. Later that night, the lieutenant reached the barracks. He made his way along the empty passages, dead tired and with a bad headache. Near his room, he almost fell over his batman, who was huddled up outside the door, fast asleep. Lieutenant Hoffmuller, sir. There's someone to see you. Baron! At last, Lieutenant, at last! Where have you been? We've had the most terrible day. Forgive my coming here, but what's happened? Is Edith... She won't go! She won't try the new cure. But why? She says she won't be tortured any longer. She won't be lied to anymore. She won't be cured. Do you know why? She says, I want to remain a cripple. There's no point in my getting better because he... He feels nothing but pity for me. Now he had said it. And there was silence in the room. Then the old man moved suddenly and awkwardly. He lurched out of his chair to his knees... And as the lieutenant hurried to help him up, the old man took his hands in his. You must help her. You're the only one who can be merciful. She might do something violent to herself. She tried it twice already. You're the only one who can save her. But of course, sir, if you want, we'll go to the castle straight away and I'll try to persuade her. But tell me what I'm to say to her, what I'm to do. What you're to do? But don't you really understand? She offered herself to you. She wrote to you and you didn't answer Oh, why are you so heartless? Is she really so unattractive? Is the whole thing unthinkable? You'd have everything a man could wish for. I'm old and sick. Everything that I possess will be yours. All I want is for her to have somebody when I am gone. Baron, I swear to you, no one could be fonder of your daughter than I am. It's just that... I, I, I mean, it's pointless if I say anything today. At the moment, the only thing that's important is that she should be cured. But then, then when she is cured... The lieutenant sensed danger. If he promised anything now, he was committed. But in the same moment, it occurred to him that her hopes were based on deception. Yes, when she's cured, of course. Then I should come to her myself. May I? May I tell her that? Once again, the lieutenant sensed danger but he no longer had the strength to withstand Kekas Valva's pleading. Yes. You can tell her. Ah, oh, sir. Please come into the drawing room. Miss Edith is expecting you. Thank you. You have saved Edith's life. Now, come quickly. I can't tell you how impatiently she's waiting for you. I'm so glad you are here. You'll be amazed at the way she's transformed. I haven't seen her so serene, so cheerful since she's been ill. It's a miracle, a real miracle. At last. At last. Oh, you're here. No, don't say anything. You're here. Now I want to be cured. I want to be well again. For your sake. For you, my dearest. They sat down to dinner. 
The silver gleamed in the candlelight, and the flowers lifted from their vases like so many colored flames. The glitter of the crystal chandeliers was thrown from mirror to mirror. The old man sat upright at the head of the table. Never had Edith and Ilona seemed younger. The fruit glowed in the bowls. The footman filled the glasses with champagne. Edith, may I drink your health? Yes, my health. I want my health back for your sake. We must all pray for it. The old man stood up. He could hardly speak. The lieutenant went round the table and embraced him. Then he saw Edith looking at him with her great grey eyes. He saw her lips parted. He bent over her quickly and kissed her on the mouth. This was the betrothal. I hadn't kissed her out of pity. The whole moment moved me so much that I had done so without thinking, without intending it. Suddenly I felt Edith's hand on mine. Let me have your hand for a minute. I felt something cool and smooth on my finger. Something for you to remember me by when I'm away. I didn't even look at the ring. I took her hand and kissed it. On that evening, I had created a human being. I was God. On my left sat an old man whom I had brought back from death. He was almost youthful again, gratefully aware of the miracle I was performing. Near me sat a girl to whom my kiss had brought paradise. Gone were her fears, the hell in which she had been suffering. Opposite her sat another girl who was more beautiful than she had ever been, for gratitude was shining in her eyes. I was God that evening. I had also got rid of my own fears. My soul was calmer than it had ever been before in my life. It was only when I got up from the table that I began to feel slightly sad. The same sadness God must have felt on the seventh day when his work was done. For it was time for me to go. If only he had left the house more quickly. But suddenly the hall door flew open. Edith was leaning against the doorpost. She supported herself with her left hand, and with the right she threw the two crutches away. No one need help me. I can do it alone already. I can come to you by myself. She pushed herself into a standing position. Looking straight at the lieutenant, she began to walk towards him unsteadily. One step, then another. She was walking. Come to me. With her arms wide apart. One more step. Now... One more. It was like the proving flight of a bird that had had its wings clipped. She had only two more steps to take when she collapsed on the floor at his feet. Ilona, Josef, and Kekka's father rushed forward and helped her up. She was sobbing in impotent rage. This moment tore away my illusion. I was no god. I was a miserable human being. I was weak and full of pity, and my pity was destructive. It was now or never. I should have helped her up, gone after her, sat by her bed. I should have told her lies. I should have praised the way she'd walked and stressed how effective the cure would be. But I hadn't got the strength. I couldn't delude her any more. I was afraid, suddenly, afraid of this strange misfortune that I couldn't do anything to change. Without thinking what I was doing, I grabbed my cap and sword and for the third and last time fled like a criminal from the house. But where could he go? Not back to the emptiness of his room. He wanted something to drink, something to burn away all his thoughts. The cafe in the main square was still open. Hello, Tony. Well, this is a great day for you. <laughs> yeah, may I offer my congratulations? For what? Well, the chemist was here a moment ago. He's heard it all. The old man up at the castle had just telephoned him. So, you're engaged to the lady of the castle? They all looked at him. He could see from their expressions that they were waiting for him to confirm the rumor. Then they would all roar with laughter. What a crazy idea. It isn't true, Tony, is it? Well, of course not. There's not a word of truth in it. I said so. I said so, didn't I? It's just one of the chemist's silly lies. I'll tell him a thing or two when I see him tomorrow. How dare he spread gossip about one of us? I knew it all along. I said so. Oh, it'd have suited the old boy down to the ground to palm the girl off on one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Hofmiller had got engaged at 10 o'clock, and three hours later he denied this engagement. 
His lies were applauded by seven witnesses. With the engagement ring still on his finger, he sat in the cafe and allowed Kekas Falva to be insulted and Edith to be jeered at. He let his friends call the chemist a liar. He had betrayed a girl whose only fault was in loving him too passionately. Tomorrow, the whole town would know what he had said. It was the end. He had no choice left. Lieutenant Hoffman, sir, this is a new fashion, is it? To wear your overcoat unbuttoned? I won't tolerate sloppy behaviour. All my officers must be correctly dressed at all times, even at two o'clock in the morning. Understand? Sir. Dismiss. I said dismiss. Have you got ears? I request an interview with you, sir. At 2 a.m.? It must be an ugly story to be that important. All right, come to my room. We'll settle this easily. Tomorrow I'll send for all seven before they set foot on the parade ground. And when I finish with them, God forgive the man who remembers what you said to him. I'll see the chemist separately, explain you were drunk and hasn't the foggiest notion what those seven chaps were asking you. That's point one. Point two. Have you been getting up to something with this girl, eh? Know what I mean? No, sir. Right, while well, we're in the clear. Tomorrow you disappear from this place and go to the reserve regiment at Cheslau. I'll write you the order and give you a letter to their CO. What I'll say is no concern of yours. All you've got to do is to disappear. I'll take care of the rest, right? Come here at 5.30 sharp and I'll give you the letter. Then you're off. Understand? Sir. Sir. Shaffer, how long is the train stopped for? Oh, only about five minutes, sir. Where's the telegraph office? Uh, third door on the left, sir. Uh, telegram form, please. It won't get there all that quickly. There's so much on the wires today. What with the news and all? Well, what should you write? Not too many details. That's the main thing. Edith von Kekersvalva. Kekersvalva. Love and greetings called away unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. Believe in me no matter what. No matter what. Returning soon, writing on arrival, always Anton. Anton? Hoffman. He gives the girl the telegram form. She is infuriatingly slow. Twenty-three words. You must put your address on it. I haven't got one. I'm on the train. Then you must put down your destination. We must have an address. Oh, my train's leaving in a minute. Oh, uh, put uh, Cheslau. Yes, the, the barracks at Cheslau. He only just catches the train. He is about to ask what the news is when the train moves off. He sinks back on the cushions of his first-class carriage, exhausted after two anxious days and two sleepless nights. She can't be uneasy now. She must trust him. That evening in Chaslau, it is as much as he can do to climb the stairs to his hotel room. He falls into his sleep as into a gulf. Gradually, out of the darkness, a dream formed. I can't remember how it began. He was standing in a room. I think it was Condor's waiting room. And suddenly, he could hear Edith's crutches tapping rhythmically. At first, it was a long way away. As if it were out in the street. Then it came nearer and nearer. So terrifyingly near at last that it seemed just beyond the door. He woke up, sweating with fear. <laughs> Wanted on the phone, sir. On the phone? Oh, if, where am I? Oh, yes. Just low. What's the time? It's midnight. Do hurry, sir. It's long distance from Vienna. Oh, run and tell them I'm just coming. He pulled his overcoat on over his pyjamas and ran downstairs. From Vienna? It could only be Condor. The telephone stood in the corner of the reception desk. The porter had the receiver to his ear. Uh, yeah, quickly, give it to me. They've rung off. Uh, hello? Hello? He couldn't hear anything. Just a distant crackling and buzzing. Hello? Hello? Nothing. He waited, listened pressing the instrument to his ear. At last. Are you through? No. Hold the line a moment. I'll try and connect you. The line hummed and crackled. There was nothing. Suddenly he heard very far away, but very clear. Higher command, Crown. Is that the Ministry of War? No, it isn't. No. Clear the line. It is essential I speak to the Ministry of War. Sorry. I tried to connect you, but the lines had to be interrupted. An emergency call. Please hang up now. 
I'll call you back when the line's free. Please do. It's very urgent. You go and wait in your room, sir. I'll come up straight away as soon as the call comes through. No, I'll, I'll wait here. Be, be on the safe side. He waited half an hour. He was shivering with disquiet and cold, yet he was sweating. Vienna. What could Condor want? The lieutenant refused to wait a minute longer. He went to the phone furiously. Hello? Hello? Has my call come through? Which call? Uh, Vienna. It was from Vienna more than half an hour ago. I'll inquire. Hold the line a minute, please. The minute seemed an eternity. Hello, caller. I can't seem to find out anything yet. If you replace the receiver, I'll ring you back as soon as I know. A few more minutes. It takes no time for a man to die or for a continent to be plunged in war. The lieutenant was feverish. Every second seemed vital. Yes? Hello? I've inquired about that call. It's been cancelled. Cancelled? But why? Why ring me up at 12.30 and 1.30 cancel the call? Something must have happened. I must know. He was afraid of the time and distance separating him from Condor. Shall I ring Condor myself? No, not in the middle of the night. His wife would be worried probably realized it was late himself and he'll ring again in the morning. He nodded to the porter and staggered back to his room. Physically exhausted and yet wide awake in himself, he threw himself down on his bed. He lay there, afraid of each step in the corridor, of every noise in the street. Finally, he fell into a deep and dreamless sleep. He woke up. It was broad daylight. He glanced at his watch. Half past ten. I was supposed to report to the CO at ten. He put on his uniform and rushed downstairs past the porter. Uh, sir, they... Uh, no, no, later. I, I, I've got to go to the barracks. But, sir... The whole garrison was on parade. Just in time, the lieutenant slipped into place beside the chaplain. The general was announced. He came forward slowly and read from a sheet of paper every eye was focused on. A crime has been committed that has shocked our empire and the whole of the civilized world. Crime? What crime? He suddenly noticed he was trembling. The foul murder... He started to sweat. ...of our beloved heir to the throne. The heir's been assassinated? When? Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his duchess. That's what the newsboys were shouting about yesterday in Brunn. This terrible blow has plunged our royal house into mourning. He no longer heard what the general was saying. But the imperial army is... The words crime and murder struck his heart. Crime, murder, they were Condor's words. Without going to see his CO, he ran back to his hotel. Perhaps there had been a call for him. Oh, sir, there's a telegram come for you. Huh? It came this morning. I wanted to give it to you first thing, but you hurried by me and... Uh, yes, yes, yes. I couldn't give it to you. He tore open the envelope. He didn't understand the message. There was no signature. Then he realized what it was. It was simply an official communication to say that his own telegram, which had been handed in at Brune Station at 3.58, could not be delivered. Could not be delivered? He stared at the words. A telegram to Edith von Kekeswalfer could not be delivered. But everyone knew her in that little town... Please get me, Vienna. Dr. Condor, Florian Gasser, 97. Is it urgent? Yes, very urgent. In 20 minutes, he was through. In five minutes, he knew everything. Directly after he had left the cafe, his friends had gone round to the chemist's house, woken him up and accused him of being a liar. The next morning, feeling very angry, the chemist had gone up to the castle and told Kekka's father everything, believing he had been misinformed. The two men quarreled violently, and their argument was so loud that Edith heard the whole thing through the open windows. She probably made up her mind then, but she kept on behaving serenely and even cheerfully. She did ask Josef secretly to get in touch with the barracks and ask when Lieutenant Hofmiller would be back and whether perhaps he hadn't left a note. The orderly reported that Lieutenant Hofmiller had been posted elsewhere for an indefinite period and hadn't left any sort of message for anybody. This had decided her. 
In the afternoon, she had herself taken up to the top of the tower. She said it was so that she could look at the landscape before she went away for her cure. At half past four, the time the lieutenant always used to visit her, and no more than 15 minutes before his telegram arrived, she asked Elona to go and fetch a certain book. And then she threw herself over the balcony and fell from the tower down onto the courtyard. She was still alive when Condor found her. Still unconscious, she was taken to Vienna in an ambulance. At eight, Condor learned of the lieutenant's whereabouts and tried to get in touch with him. But on that fatal July night in 1914, when the heir to the throne was assassinated, all the telephone lines were commandeered on urgent state business. Condor tried to get through for four hours. After midnight, the doctors announced that there was no more hope, and he cancelled the call. Edith died half an hour later. I escaped into the war like a thief into the night. I searched for death, but death eluded me, and I was condemned to go on living. In Beware of Pity by Stefan Zweig, adapted for radio by Gert Westphal and translated by Harry Guest, the commentator was Simon Lack, Lieutenant Hofmiller, David Peel, Baron Kekersfalver, George Hagen, Edith, Sheila Grant, Dr. Condor, Rolf Lefever, and Ilona, June Tobin. Other parts were played by James Thomason, Hilda Schroeder, James Beatty, and members of the BBC Drama Repertory Company. The programme, which was recorded, was produced by Martin C. Webster. That was the second hearing of last Saturday's broadcast. Now, our next programme follows in a minute and three quarters. <laughs>